What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another Tidal Gardens Coral Spotlight. This video is all about Montipora. The common name for Montipora is Velvet Coral, but I can basically count on zero fingers how many times I've ever heard anyone use that name in reference to this coral. Montipora are arguably the second most popular small polyp stony coral behind Acropora, and this is for good reason. Montipora possess both diverse color as well as a multitude of growth forms. With just a little bit of searching, a reef hobbyist can find plating, encrusting, or branching varieties of Montipora in just about any texture or color. Montipora also tend to be easier to care for than Acropora, making them a little more appealing to beginner hobbyists looking to try SPS for the first time. Montipora are a super popular coral, and this is a big topic, so let's dive right in. Montipora are a genus of small polyp stony corals found in reefs throughout the world. They are one of the primary reef building corals and are responsible for a large percentage of a reef's calcium carbonate structure. Most of the specimens found in the hobby today originate from the Pacific, mainly Indonesia and Australia. The care requirements for Montipora vary to some degree because of their diversity. Some species are hardy and fast growing to the point that they can overgrow an aquarium, such as this ubiquitous orange plating Capricornus. Other variants are slower growing and more sensitive to tank conditions like this Paloanensis. Sometimes the sensitivity of a particular Montipora doesn't have anything to do with the growth rate or survivability, but they may take on suboptimal coloration which kind of undermines a major reason why an aquara selected that particular piece to begin with. Now that you have some background information on Montipora, let's talk about their care requirements. The care tips we're going to go over in this video are intended to provide a baseline that'll give hobbyists the best chance for success. They may be overkill for some of the hardier species of Montipora, while the more delicate specimens they're probably going to require additional TLC to keep them healthy. It's easy to jump right into talking about care requirements like lighting, flow, water chemistry, but first and foremost, Montipora like consistent parameters. Now the challenge with maintaining consistency is that those parameters are a moving target. When you provide Montipora with favorable conditions, they grow, and in many cases, grow quickly, which changes those conditions. A fast-growing SPS reef is a constantly shifting landscape that the hobbyist has to adjust for. For example, lighting can change as bulbs and fixtures age, but the light that a coral receives also changes as the colony grows. The intensity increases for the parts of the colony that extend upwards towards the light, while simultaneously shading all the parts below it. Water flow changes as pumps get gummed up over time. However, even if you're on top of maintaining all of your aquarium pumps, the Montipora colonies can grow densely packed branches or plates that dramatically cut down on the flow in the tank. Lastly, chemistry changes as the uptake of major and minor elements accelerates as colonies grow. This is not a linear process at all. Once a colony takes off in growth, the consumption of major and minor elements is practically exponential. In extremely packed SPS tanks, it's common for a hobbyist to have to incorporate several methods of calcium and alkalinity addition because the growth of the coral outpaced the ability of any one single supplementation method to keep up. I cannot stress enough the importance of long-term stability. So if you're successful growing a lot of SPS, make sure to pay even closer attention because future success may be a completely different methodology than what got you to this point. 
All right, having said all that, let's cover each of these parameters in depth, starting with lighting. Montipora are photosynthetic and are one of the most light demanding corals in the hobby. Like many corals, Montipora have a special symbiotic relationship with dinoflagellates called zooxanthellae that live inside its tissue. The dinoflagellates carry out the actual photosynthesis. The coral animal derives nutrients off of the byproducts of that photosynthetic process. Zooxanthellae is kind of brown in color, and the coral tightly regulates the population that's living in its flesh depending on its nutritional needs. Hobbyists that are looking to find that just right color play with both lighting intensity and spectrum over their tank. As a starting point, we recommend initially providing light intensity around, let's say, 125 to 150 par, and slowly increasing that over time. In our systems, Montipora have fared best when given light intensity right around 2 to 300 par. However, there's plenty of successful systems with light intensities much higher than even that. Having said that, I don't recommend blasting newly added Montipora with a ton of light. More damage is caused by overexposure to light intensity than not providing enough light, so take a couple of weeks to allow the coral to adjust to lighting conditions in your system. As for lighting technology, LED fixtures dominate the product landscape. Most new aquariums these days use LEDs for their energy efficiency, low heat emissions, lack of bulb replacement costs, and ultimate controllability. Now, having said that, there's no consensus within the reef community as to what lighting is really best for growth and coloration of Montipora. There are some old school reefers that swear by metal halide lights and T5 fluorescent bulbs. Each type of light has its positive and negatives. T5 and metal halide, for example, are amazing performers with a proven track record of successfully growing corals for decades. The downside to them is that they're not particularly energy efficient. They kick out a ton of heat and require potentially expensive bulb replacements. And there is that situation of limited controllability. LED lights, on the other hand, improve on T5 and metal halide in all those above categories, but they do have their drawbacks as well. When LEDs first entered the market, there were questions of their viability growing corals and achieving comparable coloration compared to metal halide and fluorescent. Many early adopters ended up switching back to their original lighting systems because they got less than ideal results with LED. At that time, the lighting spectrum of LEDs was not all that robust, and to this day they still kind of struggle for niche applications such as photography or videography, which I tend to care a lot about. In that sense, LEDs are the worst lights ever made for photography. Perhaps more important than spectrum is that many of the fixtures initially struggled with adequately diffusing the light coming from the LEDs themselves. Early models of LED fixtures produced a highly directional spotlight pattern. So what would happen is that the tops of a coral colony would receive light and they would grow, but a harsh shadow would be cast on the portions of the colony that did not get spotlighted. Now that harsh shadow was basically zero light and that dark part of the colony would initially struggle and then die off. So you would have this weird appearance of only the top part of the coral alive and the entire bottom half dead. Today, LED technology has come a long way in terms of both lighting spectrum and diffusion, making it a very attractive choice given its other advantages. Lighting spectrum was solved to some degree by the introduction of different colored LEDs. Diffusion was handled by a change in the optics around each LED, as well as optional diffuser plates to further scatter the light before it hits the water. If you're the type of aquarist that likes the best of all worlds, hybrid lighting systems exist that combine either LED and e either T5 or metal halide. There might even be some systems out there that are a combination of all three technologies.
Let's move on to water flow. Montipora appreciates strong flow, preferably with some randomness to it. There is such a thing as too much flow, however. If you have a powerhead blowing right at the coral from a short distance, it may kill off some of the tissue at that point of contact. Another problem that you might run into with very strong flow is if you have a plating colony of Montipora. The shape of the colony can act like a parachute and it can lift right off the rocks if it gets hit by too much flow. Another thing to pay attention to with regard to flow is maintaining consistency of flow as time goes on. There's two things over time that dramatically affect the performance of your water flow systems. The first is the growth of the colony itself. Successfully growing Montipora comes with this downside of the coral cutting down the flow significantly. As corals get larger and larger, it's important as hobbyists to pay close attention to changing flow demands and consider adding more flow or pruning the colony to allow more space for water to flow through. Secondly, other organisms such as algae, sponges, and other sessile invertebrates love to grow in and around an aquarium's pumps and plumbing. For this reason, I recommend taking apart pumps and powerheads regularly for servicing. It really does not take very much growth or blockage to greatly, and I mean greatly, limit water flow output. Even if you're not able to provide super strong flow in your tank, one thing you're going to want to pay attention to is detritus settling on either encrusting or plating colonies of Montipora. The shape of these corals, as they grow, create low areas that act as detritus traps. If there's not enough flow to blow these areas clean, the detritus that accumulates will kill off that portion of the colony. If this is a problem that you're running into in your aquarium, you have to either add more flow or manually clean off that accumulation with something like a turkey baster. Moving on from water flow, let's talk a bit about chemistry. Montipora require both clean water and consistent high levels of major ions to maintain their growth rate. They're not quite as temperamental as Acropora, however, suboptimal water chemistry can lead to undesirable changes in color or cause the polyps of the coral to retract for extended periods of time. There are three major chemical parameters that are needed by Montipora to build its stony skeleton. These parameters are calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. Starting first with calcium. Calcium is one of the major ions in salt water. In the ocean, its level hovers around 425 parts per million. As a coral grows, calcium is taken in and it forms its calcium carbonate skeleton. Alkalinity is not a particular ion per se, but you can think of it as the buffering capacity of water. So what the heck is buffering capacity? In layman's terms, it's chemical stability. Basically, how resistant is this chemical mix to change? Technically, it's the amount of acid required to lower the pH of salt water to the point that bicarbonate turns into carbonic acid. If you have more alkalinity, it can soak up more acid while keeping things steady. Less alkalinity and you have less buffering capacity making the tank more susceptible to chemical changes. In practice, alkalinity tends to be the parameter that fluctuates the most of the three and the one that needs the most babysitting. In the wild, the alkalinity of water is around 8 or 9 dKH, though some aquarists like to overload this parameter just a little bit and keep their tanks right around 10 or 11 dKH. The reason for this is that there's some belief that having an elevated calcium and alkalinity level in the water contributes to faster stony coral growth, but that's probably a topic that deserves a video of its own. One quick note about adjusting calcium and alkalinity is that it can be tricky because of how they interact. Addition of a calcium supplement often comes with a corresponding fall in alkalinity levels. This seesaw effect between calcium and alkalinity stems from how the two ions interact with one another. The two ions combine to form calcium carbonate and then they fall out of solution, thus lowering both levels. 
If you're experiencing this in your systems, the possible culprit may be a third chemical parameter, magnesium. It may seem counterintuitive that the solution to calcium and alkalinity imbalances is to elevate magnesium, but those three ions interact regularly. So magnesium is very similar chemically to calcium. It can bind up carbonate ions, thus increasing the overall bioavailability of alkalinity compounds in the water. If you're tweaking calcium and alkalinity and getting strange results, you may want to make sure that it's not your magnesium level that's in fact low. So in the ocean, magnesium sits at around 1350 parts per million, and that's really what you should be shooting for. Having said all that, I would again stress that stability is the ultimate goal. When you're looking to raise any of these chemical parameters, it's best to work very slowly and let the change happen over the course of months, not days. By achieving success in a fast-growing coral like Montipora, it makes stability a little more difficult to achieve long-term. Successful SPS-filled tanks experience rapid growth, and larger colonies soak up calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, and trace elements at a much faster rate. At first, just regular water changes may be sufficient to keep up with the chemistry demands of the corals, but as their biomass increases, you may have to work in supplementation, such as calcwasser, calcium reactors, or two-part dosing, perhaps even a combination of all three. Next topic, feeding. Montipora and SPS corals in general don't seem like the type of coral that would require feeding. They don't really put on a dramatic feeding display like some large polyp stony corals. And even under close macro photography, they don't seem to appreciate target feeding. In fact, target feeding often elicits the opposite response, where the coral closes up on contact and really wants nothing to do with it. It is clear that Montipora get the majority of their nutrition from lighting, but the requirements extend beyond that. Sometimes a Montipora colony will just look rather drab in appearance, and it's kind of hard to pinpoint why. Water chemistry is good, it's getting plenty of light, there's no real visible pests or other harassment going on, and the flow is great at that point in the tank. In this situation, that coral may be hungry. But wait, didn't we just say that feeding was a no-go? Despite not being the most aggressive feeder in the world, there are three great sources of food that work well for broadcast feeding. These three are amino acids, small zooplankton, and simply having fish present. Starting with amino acids, they are simple organic compounds that play a major role in building proteins as well as other biological functions at the cellular level. Corals regularly take in available amino acids from the water column, so it's fairly easy to provide them with adequate quantities by simply providing a broadcasted daily dose from any number of commercially available reef supplement manufacturers. Next up, small zooplankton. They include organisms such as rotifers and cyclops plankton. They come frozen and are basically like a small granular oily paste and it kind of makes this orange cloud when introduced into the aquarium. The presence of rotifers in the water is immediately apparent to the corals because many of them will open up and initiate their feeding behavior. Now this is less obvious in Montipora, but I've noticed greater polyp extension when we've added a mix of frozen rotifers as well as powdered plankton foods. Last point on nutrition. Having fish in and around Montipora colonies tends to have a positive effect. Perhaps the presence as a nitrogen source in close proximity is a good thing as small quantities of both nitrogen and phosphorus are needed by corals, and that's not something that they get through photosynthesis. Okay, one last point that I'm gonna make about feeding is that although coral nutrition is important, don't go crazy with it and overfeed the aquarium. Most of the nutrition a Montipora needs will come from the lighting and absorbing other nutrients from the water. 
If you're going to experiment with some of the broadcast foods mentioned, start really slowly with it and don't expect explosive changes overnight in terms of the coral's growth or color. Really the only thing that's going to be an overnight change is a giant algae bloom from overfeeding. As for propagation and future aquaculture, Montipora are a very interesting candidate. They are one of the easiest corals to break apart and reattach to new substrate. What makes them interesting, however, is that they're one of the few corals that people are experimenting with in the way of grafting. Montipora are able to be grafted kind of like plants, where in this case the pigmentation transfers between two dissimilar looking individuals. What you end up with is kind of like this ice cream swirl of color in the body. This sort of thing is what I would like to try for myself down the line, and I'll be really curious to see what the reefing community comes up with as well. Now it's time to cover some of the ugly parts of keeping Montipora, namely pests. I would go as far as saying that there's this Montipora pest that is arguably the worst thing in the hobby, and that is Montipora eating nudibranch. There's plenty of nudibranchs that can plague a home aquarium, such as like the zoanthid eating variety, but the ones that eat Montipora are snow white in color and are absolutely terrible to deal with. The main challenge in eliminating them is that they are highly resistant to dipping. They require pretty heavy concentrations of whatever dip that you like to use, but on top of that, even if the nudibranchs die, the eggs are often completely unaffected. Also, there's no guarantee that these nudibranchs are always on the coral that you're dipping. Plenty of times, they're just in the tank roaming around and escape any efforts to dip a particular coral that they're eating. There are not a lot of really horrible pests in this hobby. Most of them are actually pretty easy to take care of despite the horror stories that you might hear online. These guys, however, are the real deal. I've gone as far as completely swearing off any new Montipora from the ocean because they almost always come in with them. Still, even after years of not introducing any new ones to my system, they can pop up out of nowhere. At that point, all you can do is keep dipping and hopefully knock them down without killing the corals that you're dipping. So, if you guys have any tips and tricks on dealing with Montipora eating nudibranchs, please share your experiences in the comments below. It's definitely the most challenging pest I've ever had to deal with. Okay, that pretty much does it for Montipora. Hopefully this video is helpful for those looking to try them for the first time. If you'd like more information or perhaps purchase Montipora for your home aquarium, I invite you to visit us at tidalgardens.com and check out what we have in stock. That does it for this video, so until next time, happy reefing.